So hey everyone, welcome to TPM's Merkle Trees and Teas. Uh, let's go and get started. So, hey, I'm uh, Chad Kimes. I'm a principal software engineer. Uh, I've been working on GitHub Actions since before the beta in 2019. Uh, my focus has mostly been on the GitHub hosted runners. So um, everything we do to run GitHub hosted runners at scale 20 million jobs a day, lots of fun. Uh, I've also been a founding member of the Action Security team for all that time, so we deal with bug bounties and also recommending product improvements to improve security for all of Action's users. You know, my, my interests align with supply chain security and building high availability, scalability distributed systems, which is great because my day job hits all three of those things. Uh, hi, I'm Rosella Malara. I'm a research scientist at Intel Labs where I lead software supply chain security research. Um, I also serve as a member on the OpenSSF TAC and as a maintainer um, for the Intel App Decision Framework and a couple other sub projects there uh, in the CNCF. And um, my general interests are around distributed systems, OS level security, hardware assisted security. So we're going to be covering all of those today as well. Okay. So to give you a very brief overview of what we're going to be covering, we're going to start with the status quo, especially around the OpenSSF Salsa framework and CACD uh, builds and pipelines. Um, then we're going to move into uh, the problem and the importance of validating build environments. Next, we're going to jump into the nitty gritty crypto and hardware stuff, which is why we're all here today. We're going to cover the TPMs, uh, the Verity modules, Merkle trees, TEs, and confidential computing. And then we're going to take a step back and see how that, <clears throat> excuse me, how that uh, can sort of fit in as salsa enhancements and conclude. So we're assuming that most people here have some base knowledge of software supply chain uh, technologies, primitives, uh, including provenance, attestations, and signing. Um, but just to sort of set some context, salsa provenance provides this detailed record about the build process. It seeks to bind uh, inputs that went into a build with the output in a verifiable way. Um, the next layer is uh, what Intuit attestations provide as a standard data, data format for attestations about any claim and aspect um, of the software supply chain. So it's really meant to be sort of, I tend to think of it almost as a, like a transport layer for any um, supply chain attestations. And finally, SIGSTORE provides this identity management service on the one hand, um, provisioning the uh, digital identities needed to sign and authenticate the attestations. And on the other hand, um, provides this public transparency log that can be used to uh, validate the uh, generated signatures, really. So what do we get from these three uh, primitives? And that is cryptographic verify, a cryptographic verifiable link between a software artifact and the build process that created it. Just to give also a refresher on Salsa and the current build track version one, you can think of Salsa having these three main levels that uh, seek to incrementally uh, set requirements for uh, implementing security and integrity mechanisms and controls um, as part of the build. So starting at build level one, with build level zero being kind of a no-op level, um, it's, we start just with the requirement to document what's going on in the build process. And as we move up these levels, um, we had an increasing uh, sort of, we set higher, a higher bar and shift the responsibility towards the build platform and begin to introduce uh, some requirements for hardening the build platform. Uh, to prevent certain types of tampering during the build. All of this, though, uh, places a lot of trust uh, in the platforms, right? This follows the Salsa guiding principle, trust platforms to verify artifacts. And this is a guiding principle that's really just rooted in practice, right? We need a TCB or trusted computing base at some point. Someone always needs to be trusted uh, to bootstrap that, that trust. Um, and platforms, uh, just have the economic and reputational incentives to get this right. They also have the resources and the experience to get this right, uh, to correctly implement security uh, mechanisms and uh, just implement Salsa. So 
why are we here? Why do build platforms need more hardening? And it really comes down to three mutually reinforcing challenges that we're showing here. So on one side, build platforms are really this high value target, uh, especially once they start handling secrets uh, and digital signing on behalf of their users. Uh, that sort of gives them an extra level of privilege that uh, they didn't have before. And at the same time, by design, they support arbitrary code execution. Right? This is precisely why build platforms um, and CI platforms allow you to run uh, builds for practically every ecosystem using practically any tool you can imagine or want. Um, and so again, once this uh, high value target, if it becomes a victim of an attack, it really provides a single point of attack amplification because these platforms often have very large user bases. Uh, some of these in the millions, right? And each of these users or customers themselves have uh, many customers. So you can hopefully begin to see this exponential amplification and expansion from a single point to many users. Um, that again happens um, in the event of, of an attack. And finally, these two top challenges are really underscored by the third challenge, which is just simply the fact that build platforms are very complex systems. Uh, if you've worked with any of these um, or are implementing them or anything like that, you know how many actors and components they involve. Um, many different organizations, um, uh, administrative domains, and so that just, that just makes them very hard to audit. So we want to set some context, uh, some, some terminology also, what we're going to be referring to today. Uh, the build environment really has many components. It's really the entire software and hardware stack uh, presented in this light blue box. Um, we tend to think of the build environment as what is actually the build image, which is running uh, the actual build in a CI. That's uh, the interface that we interact with. So. Um, that still covers a fair amount of uh, components that we largely take for granted, which is a good thing. Um, and finally, as tenants of these systems, we really only have control over that box in the that dashed line box. So um, again, many different uh, third party and first party components that are difficult to so ultimately the problem with this unquestioning trust in the build platform has three layers. Um, at the top, we really start with this assumption um, and trust in the build platform to create a good build image, right? A build image that is secure, doesn't have vulnerable dependencies and so forth. Um, but because currently these build images are generated in private, um, we don't have a very good way of detecting tampering with the generation process. The next layer is then trusting the build platform to deliver the right environment that we're expecting and to deliver a good build image again, right? Um, and it's currently very difficult to know if the environment that you're running in ultimately when you're executing your build is what you think you requested. So again, tampering with image distribution could happen and we have no easy way to detect that at the moment. And third, that third level is really trusting the build platform to, in essence, protect your build during execution. Um, and while Salsa level three already provides um, several requirements um, that build platforms can and do implement, there's still many other ways that tampering with the running environment can happen through third party components in the host or in the guest uh, system and malicious actors and so forth. So our approach is to really lean into actually another salsa guiding principle, and that is prefer attestations over inferences. Um, the idea behind this guiding principle is that whenever it's possible, um, to, we should capture explicit evidence about artifacts. And as I showed before, right, uh, the build platform really consists of cooperating software layers and many artifacts. So we want to apply that same idea to the build platform. And we think we can do this um, by leveraging existing mechanisms to attest to the build environment configuration, to the build environment components, and so forth. Right. So in order to address these, these three different problems, we can come up with a set of different solutions. So the first one is actually not that bad. 
the build image itself is a artifact of some process that we can treat like a build process, and we already have a solution for that. We just use salsa provenance. We can have a cryptographic link from an artifact back to its build steps. Therefore, we can lean on this exact technology. Um, this is already published in salsa you know, L1. <clears throat> so once we have this build image, though, we don't really have the opportunity to verify it like we normally would any other artifact because we're, you're exposed to it as a VM. You don't have this binary artifact that you can run a hashing algorithm on. You're inside of a virtual machine. How do you actually validate that your build image for, uh, <clears throat> for your, that you're using for your virtual machine was the one that actually matches the provenance statement? So that's what we're gonna get into. Uh, but in order to like, get into all that, I have to give a lot of recap. So we're gonna go over trusted platform modules, or TPMs. We're gonna talk about how those enable something called measured boot, uh, look into options for file system integrity checking, and lastly wrap up with uh, an overview of confidential compute. So um, TPMs, trusted platform modules, they are defined by a 1200 page specification from the TCG. Uh, I'm saying this to point out that they are complicated. And I'm trying to going to simplify to the extent that I can without being entirely incorrect. Uh, an interesting property of TPMs is that they have a key pair that is burned into the silicon. So uh, the private key is inaccessible unless you have you know, access to the TPM and an electron microscope. Um, <clears throat> the public key is readable using an API from that TPM. And typically, TPMs will include a manufacturer signed certificate for that public key, basically representing that this public key belongs to a real TPM. Assuming you trust the manufacturer uh, to handle their private key properly, then you can trust them to say you know, this public key represents a real TPM. TPMs also have these things called platform configuration registers. So uh, PCRs, they are effectively just banks of registers that hold hash length values. They just hold hashes. Uh, the only way to update the registers is to use this thing called an extend operation. So extend operations have a, an interesting property that when you extend the same data into a PCR, you always end up with the same result. So what does that actually look like? What is an extend operation? So spelled out in words, uh, to extend a PCR, you take the original value that was in it, you hash the new data that you want to add into it, append that to the original value, and take the resulting hash of the entire thing. So we can walk through this in a quick example. We have this, uh, this hex string 0x0, I want to extend into this PCR my, my hex string 0x decaf bad. So I'm going to hash it, I get my 0x40 zero string, and in order to get my new value, I append it to my original all zeros, take the final hash, and what ends up in the register is this 0x707 string. So if you think about this, like it has a similar property to something you all are very familiar with, likely, which is git commits. If I, you know, a git commit, the SHA of git commit represents all of the data that went into the commit and all of the previous commits before it. And in the same way, PCR values are a hash that represents all of the data that was used to generate that PCR. So I have PCRs, what can I do with them? Uh, so TPMs also expose this quote operation. So quoting is just signing. It's taking the, the private key of the TPM and selecting a certain set of the PCRs and you sign it with that private key. So a third party verifier can then take that quote, take your public key and the signature or the uh, certificate that shows that it is a real TPM. And with all of that, they can perform the cryptographic operations to prove the state of the PCR registers in that TPM. So great, we have, we have the ability to measure things in the TPM, we have PCRs, we have quoting. Okay, how does that apply to CICD? What, like, you know, our whole goal here is to improve CSD. So what, what can we do with this? Uh, unfortunately, we're not there yet. So I gotta do some more recap. Um, <clears throat> so I wanna go over like a standard-ish uh, UEFI and Linux boot sequence. So your, hard your hardware boots up, you hit the power on button, your hardware then loads your firmware. Your firmware then uh, starts looking for option ROMs that are in, uh, so option ROMs are these things that are like in your expansion cards, think your NIC or your GPU that describe how the motherboard should interact with those cards. It's executable code that runs on your machine. Um, <clears throat> the firmware then loads up your bootloader, think Grub, and then Grub is responsible for pulling in your kernel and NRMFS, and then that loads your file system. 
for anyone who's not familiar, an init ramfs is an initial RAM file system. It's a temporary execution environment that is often used to set up the rest of the file system or set up the machine. So uh, a canonical example here is disk encryption. So if I'm going to decrypt my disk, I might need a password from the user or I might need to read a USB drive that they stick into the machine. Uh, I can use the Linux kernel to, to do all these things and interact with all my hardware devices, but I need an unencrypted execution environment just to start. So um, typically this is performed in like an NRMFS, and then as soon as you do all the decryption of the file system, you pass off execution to it, and then that initial RAM file system goes away. So the TCG and the UEFI uh, spec maintainers have created this thing called measured boot, or often referred to as measured boot. And the idea is that each step in the boot chain is responsible for measuring the next steps before execution. So what is a measurement? A measurement is very simply an extension of that data of the next step into a specific PCR location for in a TPM. Additionally, all of those boot events are written into a log, the idea being that uh, a PCR hash is inscrutable. I can't really do anything with a PCR hash, but if I have all of the events of data that were read into it, then I can reconstruct the PCR hash. So blowing that original diagram up, we start with our hardware, which is our root of trust. We trust the hardware, and that is what provides the, um, the trust chain for the rest of the system. The hardware measures the firmware before executing it. The firmware then starts looking at all of the configuration that is in your machine, because configuration can change the execution. You know, it looks at what your UEFI configuration is, what your BIOS set is. Uh, it looks at your boot devices, uh, it checks your secure boot state, so like what certificates are you allowing for signatures on your on your bootloader, and you know, what hashes are you disallowing. Uh, your firmware is also respons responsible for measuring your bootloader before executing it. And then, specific to Grub, you know, bootloader, uh, Grub is going to load up your kernel and your interim MFS. It also loads your, uh, it measures your kernel configuration because your kernel command line, for example, can change how your kernel executes. And then finally, we get into the file system after measuring all of that stuff before it. So, some things to take away is the same boot chain, the same events in the same order, results in the same PCRs. And then, if you have that log, you can reconstruct your PCR values remotely by you know, putting these two together. And putting it all together, we can measure our boot chain into the TPM PCRs, we can use that TPM's private key to quote them, and then we can validate that quote remotely as a third party using that TPM's public key and that event log. So the, the final takeaway is if you assume, if you trust that each layer it will measure the layer after it, then a third party can validate certain aspects of the system state by simply following along with the boot chain. Simply. Um, <clears throat> so note though that that file system wasn't measured, right? And there, there's a practical reason for this in most measured boot systems. Right? Because when I boot my machine, I want to use it. I want to install software, I want to use any documents, I want my computer to be usable. So uh, most measured boot systems you know, in Linux today don't really go far beyond that. Uh, there are some counter examples though. So like your mobile devices, Android and iOS, they split your, your file system, they split your block devices into a user partition and a system partition. And the user partition is your little playground. You do whatever you want inside of it, uh, mutate it, we won't measure it, we don't care. Uh, but the system partition we care a lot about, and so things like your banking apps will pay attention to, you know, make sure that the, your system hasn't been compromised before you uh, boot into your bank. So CI though is interesting because in a typical ephemeral CI service, we always expect that disk image content to be the same, right? If I create 10 VMs from the same disk image, they're always going to have the same content in that disk. So we should be able to extend all of our validation from you know, beyond the kernel in RMFS into that file system for the entire VM. So what are some options we have to do this? Oops. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I talked about this, this inner RMFS, this pre-execution environment before, before you jump into your file system. Um, <clears throat> so it's not just useful for decryption. We can also take that opportunity to measure the file system before we actually go in and execute it. And then we can pick some uh, PCR that is, you know, unused or less used in the rest of the boot process and extend our data into it, and then later TPM quota. So one option for this is very simply just hash it, right? You got a block device, it's a bunch of data, just hash it. 
Uh, it's super simple. It's the same approach as basically every layer before it used. Um, but it has some downsides. Your, your inner MFS is 20 megs, your kernels, a couple megs. Uh, all, all those are pretty small, but uh, the GitHub Actions Linux image is 60 gigabytes of software because we've loaded up with things for every, you know, every developer to use. So if we were trying to hash that on every reimage, then it would be prohibitively expensive and be really hard to run a high-scale CI service. So what other options do we have? There exist some technologies called uh, DM Verity and FS Verity, and these, these uh, create a Merkle tree of hashes. So the idea is that DM Verity it would operate on the block device itself, its device mapper Verity, and FS Verity operates on files, uh, file system Verity. So if you're unfamiliar with the Merkle tree, we'll do a, a very, very quick run through. Um, <clears throat> so in the example here with DM Verity, we have all of our block devices, or all of our blocks at the lowest layer. If I hash that block, I get a large value turned into a small value. And that brings us to the first level of the hash tree. Uh, I can then concatenate multiple hashes to generate another layer and do this recursively until I get up to the top level, a single root hash. And then if I want to validate, so let's say, the read of a disk at runtime, then I can walk this tree recursively and take a logarithmic cost in order to do so. And interestingly, it's a, it's a hashing uh, operation. So it's CPU bound versus latency bound disk reads. And it's basically unnoticeable because it's super fast to hash versus super slow to read from a remote you know, disk. Uh, so the perf overhead of doing this is actually quite minimal. What's interesting though is we can't really measure our like, all entire hash tree into our TPM. Um, but what we can do instead is measure the configuration for uh, what we want to do into our PCRs. So the idea here being if I trust my inner MFS to properly set up the DM Verity and FS Verity drivers, and I trust those drivers to reject a read if it detects corrupted data, then I simply have to measure the fact that I configured those things, those modules into my inner MFS, or I'm sorry, into my TPM. So this results in a minimal upfront cost. It's you know, basically instant uh, running this configuration. Uh, and you know, the downsides are it is additional complexity to reason about. Uh, and also, Verity devices, when they're being verified, they must be read-only. You're measuring, you, know, you want to measure a constant thing. So there are ways to work around this, such as using an overlay file system, like the multiple layers in your containers might do. Or you can use device mapper snapshots, which are basically overlays for block devices. So we have TPMs that can provide remote validation. We have technologies in mainline Linux kernel that provide file system measurement. So all of this technology already exists. So with that, we can today generate VM image provenance and validate it at runtime inside of a VM. All right, so with the first two layers of this trust but verify problem for build platforms addressed, there still is that third layer around um, reducing trust and, and verifying really. Um, how the build platform uh, manages to protect a build during execution time. And so our recommendation there in general approach is to check the execution context against the build environment. And what does that mean? So at a very high level, it means binding the build execution to the environment in a verifiable way. Um, we think of doing this by generating a unique immutable build execution ID and including that in the build environment's attestation, so again, TPM attestation, for example, prior to executing the build. So if you're running in a GitHub Actions uh, environment, for example, that would be the job ID that's generated for one of your uh, workflows when, when, when that's triggered. Um, and that can then be, again, sort of measured into um, a uh, environment like a TPM. The goal of all of this is then to detect whether or not the build environment has been tampered with during a particular build execution. So if the expected job ID that you were assigned uh, together with the build environment that you expected suddenly don't match when you verify, uh, you can sort of know that uh, something changed in the, in the build environment. The good news is that we have existing technologies like TE hardware um, that are designed for this type of use case. So a quick primer 
on TEEs or trusted execution environments for those who uh, are not familiar or may need a refresher. Uh, they are environments that are capable of running entire programs, unlike TPMs, but support measurement and quoting operations over the program memory to enable code and data integrity checking. And I have portions of program memory in a parenthetical here because it's actually implementation dependent uh, how much of the program memory is measured. Um, but in general, all of these uh, TEEs, I shouldn't say all, but typically they support uh, program data encryption as well to provide additional data confidentiality properties. So what's important to know here is that program data, such as a unique build execution ID, can be measured at runtime um, and, and be bound to the TE by including it in the TE's measurement. And we're listing a couple of examples at the bottom of the slide here, just to show the variety of vendors and implementations uh, that are out there, but we will not go into the details today. Um, specifically, CPU-based TEEs um, are sort of a subset of the general TE paradigm. Uh, they provide program measurement, extend, and quoting operations again. Uh, but these are implemented uh, through dedicated CPU instructions. So there are hardware special instructions that um, need to be executed in order to interact with, with those operations, um, in addition to some special registers, typically. Um, some of these TEs also use hardware-based encryption for the memory to protect the code and the data while it's in use. Though we'll note that um, the Verity uh, modules that Chad was describing earlier are still often needed to provide that file system level integrity as well. So what's important to note here is that uh, confidential computing, which is a term you probably have heard in this context, is a special type of hardware-based or CPU-based TE that in addition to the three main operations that we expect, supports uh, attestation between remote parties. And that is to essentially mutually authenticate uh, between two TEs that are trying to uh, cooperate and, and interact. Um, and again, just sort of make sure that uh, they are what each party expects, right? And again, there are several examples, um, several different vendors, implementations, uh, levels of granularity that uh, are covered. Uh, in the context of build platforms and builds, uh, we are focusing on confidential VMs. So as the name suggests, this is a CPU-based TE that uh, operates at the granularity of a virtual machine and typically has a dedicated trusted hypervisor module that manages these VMs and they're typically running uh, alongside traditional VMs on the same machine. And essentially the reason why we're focusing on um, this type of TE specifically is for three main benefits. So they provide a hardware root of trust uh, that is attested and um, again provides that same trust chain model that we saw earlier um, that, that TPMs have. Um, and in addition to that, they provide VM granular memory encryption, which really is just kind of a broader uh, confidentiality protection. And finally, more on the adoption side, um, confidential VMs have a programming and deployment model that matches how we deploy builds today. Um, so the idea is in a very ideal world, we could take an existing uh, builds environment and pick it up from a tr traditional VM and run it instead of confidential instead. It's obviously not quite so easy in practice, but that's the general idea. So ultimately what we get is uh, from confidential VMs are these remotely attestable um, enhanced integrity and confidentiality uh, environments that um, have these features during build execution. So now we've addressed these, uh, the third uh, level and um, confidential computing in particular can provide uh, several additional um, integrity and security properties on top of what TPMs and Verity provide. Um, so I'll hand it back to Chad. Yeah, so we've got all these great cool technologies now, um, but how do we bring it back? Like what are we gonna do with them? So we have a proposal out to Salsa to start uh, and either add another level or another track to provide more build platform requirements. So the Git, these are the GitLabs and Git, sorry, GitLab CIs and GitHub Actions of the world. Um, we want the build platform to run through these additional steps. So 
we want build images to have an associated salsa provenance attestation. Like, we think this is baseline, right? Your build image is an artifact. You should have a public build process that the public can inspect. That's, that's pretty simple. Um, two, it gets a little harder. We want to then be able to validate that, right? It's not good to have provenance unless we can also validate it. So you must have a hardware tested, um, virtual hardware is acceptable as well. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you must have a hardware tested boot chain and disk image so that we can run that validation. Uh, additionally, once we have that attestation for the, the disk image, you know, we must bind that to an execution ID or a job ID in whatever your CI system is. And the build platform must verify all of the attestations before actually passing off control to the user. So great, that's build platforms, um, but that's probably not you. So what do you have to do in order to actually achieve the, whatever the next version of Salsa is? And it's really a lot simpler. You really just have to run on one of these build platforms. Or if you maintain your own internal build platform, start looking into these technologies to build it. Um, <clears throat> and additionally, you really should verify the build platform's attestations prior to a build. This is a trust but verify kind of approach. Um, you can do this inside the job, or you should be able to use a, a third party verifier as well, because everything we're doing is not strictly uh, belonging to the build platform. It's something that you could do inside of your CI job as well. So if you glossed over through this entire presentation, I really think there's three things you want to take away from this, is that we need to be thinking about build, build platforms in the threat model. They are not immune to security compromise. They are large systems with lots of people that, that run in them. So compromise is inevitable, and we have to be thinking about that. We can use hardware-based attestation technologies to really increase the default security level, make certain types of attacks significantly harder to achieve. And we really want to do this through Salsa because it is this open standard framework for securing builds and increasing the security of, of all, um, both, both open and closed source builds. And it's, you know, it's achieving wide adoption in uh, many industries and it's being pushed by the OpenSSF. And so we would really like to use this to be enhancing the default integrity of all build systems. So if you want to learn more, we have a work stream issue that is a, a GitHub issue. And tomorrow we're going to have a 30 minutes at the OpenSSF booth so we can do a, a live demo. It's not, uh, we can have a little bit of code and we can talk through, it'll be interactive. So any questions you have, we can you know, dig into the really nitty gritty stuff there. So our expectation is that standardization will come as part of the Salsa proposal, like the format for how it actually you know, appears. Um, similar to, you know, provenance is standardized and they use Intoto for things. I think the plan is to use Intoto for this. Uh, yeah, um, so that, that's, that's the goal. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't read repeating questions. Yeah, so the question is, can we verify the, the build ID of any runner that, that GitHub uses? And so, uh, at least with GitHub Actions, the build ID is part of the environment variables that are passed into the job. So as part of the, the workflow, you get that build ID. Uh, so the, we really didn't do a great job here because I'm trying to get a lot of the basics, but um, the question was, can you verify that bill ID that is attached to the GitHub hardware? So um, <clears throat> the proposal actually defines that the bill platform is supposed to be running an attestation service. And when they assign a job to a particular VM, they also provide an attestation that links that job ID 
to that uh, you know, ephemeral uh, TPM. And if you're using a VTPM, we get you know one per VM. Um, so it, it, that binding is provided by the build platform. That's fair, yeah. <laughs> it's a very overloaded term. Right, so the question was, is there an opportunity, opportunity for the builder to be malicious? And uh, the answer is yes, kind of, um, because we intend that you know, the build the builder can be included in the build image itself, so it itself can be attested and measured. And ideally, the builder would also be open source and have its own provenance that can be validated, things like that. I've, I've experimented with other ideas of like running the builder itself inside of a T, so you can then attest to that. We haven't gotten that far. I want to get one thing accomplished at a time. <laughs> Of the builder itself, that's an interesting. Um, I haven't thought about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think, as as you already mentioned, um, reproducibility of builders, I think, is again just like an extra layer on top of what we've been presenting. Um, yeah, we didn't cover reproducibility in in this talk because we really did want to focus on uh, the sort of levels of of trust that we wanted to cover. But I think it does ultimately fit into this picture, um, just didn't show it today. Uh, Tom, in the back. Yeah, uh, is, um, is GitHub actually planning to like roll out this, this feature anytime soon? I'm not on the product team, I'm an engineer. Um, I will say that we are committed to supporting Salsa and what Perform it takes. Uh, you listed a number of uh, PEE technologies. Uh, this additional level of, uh, of separation. I'm, I'm curious if, uh, if AWS Nitro Enclaves is something that uh, would meet all the, the different properties that you're looking for. Uh, uh, Nitro Enclaves are, uh, per the Confidential Computing Consortium, a confidential uh, computing environment. So they're not. Uh, I think we could debate what hardware base means. I don't okay. think we want to debate that here. We can have beers later. Uh, but I think as far as you should be looking at the, the logical pro uh, properties and the promises that are made by, by the provider of technology, right? So Yeah, what, what I will say, and I will correct what I said before, trusted execution environment, but not confidential. Right. I also want to point out that we've, we've been very clear to not try to, again, dictate technologies or, you know, specific frameworks, um, we're really focusing on like the, the kind of open SSF model of focusing on outcomes. So you know, right. we, we would like to be inclusive of the US Nitro. That's totally the right, the right approach. Okay. Any others? One more. So um, I guess I know that one of the, one of the perhaps uh, criticisms that I've heard about Saul says, oh, it is something that pushes um, open source developers away from hardware that they own and onto services that they that are controlled by 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 others. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I see here is like, yes, GitHub can run it for you, but um, you know, maybe I have an uh, maybe I have hardware at home that has these 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 capabilities. To what extent would this enable? the home hobbyist to, to create a build attestation that is as trusted as whatever GitHub might produce? Yep, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, we do intend for uh, this framework to be used in a self-hosted way. So like if a, a organization wants to set up their own systems for CI, then they should be able to implement this. You can use TEs and build up their own system. Um, I think one of the requirements of Salsa is that uh, <clears throat> a build environment is hosted, whatever that might mean. So this, this is an interesting interplay between that because like, you could implement all of this without being a hosted environment, right? And then you would have a lot of security behind uh, the job. So I think there's probably something to tease out. Yeah, I think I'll just make one note before I go on to the next question, which is I think it 
at that point it comes back to institutional trust, right? Uh, do you trust that individual developer um, who is generating these verifiable attestations, um, but uh, is still an individual versus, you know, organizations that have uh, reputation, right? So, um, yes. So one of the nice things about TEs is that you don't need to trust the, whoever owns the hardware. You can do it on your own hardware if you want. It's, most of the stuff server grade and quite expensive, not easy to get hold of. Well, it's easy to get hold of if you've got the money. Um, but you, you can do it on you know, AWS, you can do it on Google, you can do it on Azure, and you don't care because the whole point of TEs and confidential computing is that you're, you don't need to trust the owner of the hardware. It's, there's isolation from the hardware. I think we should discuss that more offline. Any other final questions? Because we are at time. Yeah, thank you so much.